trying to do a sort of, you know, and we don't feel like we need to do that. First of all, the brokers I'm told are not going to, they're not going to work with us anyway because they're pretty beholden to the insurance companies, right? So we're going to have to do community brokering anyway. And so, you know, we feel like we are the community. We have the networks. And we just need a little bit of help from co-ops and business associations, you know, like from their marketing department to say, okay, you know, can you put a flyer in, in everybody's grocery bag or, you know. You know, we are a cooperative and we're sort of trying to uh, be the missing piece in the puzzle, if you will, of, uh, we have cooperatives and everything else in Minnesota, but we don't have one, uh, we don't have a large scale cooperative for health insurance. and. Uh, we really need one, and that's the purpose of, of cooperatives, is to fulfill a need when the, quote, market does not fulfill that need. And, and there's really a great need, as everybody knows, because healthcare is so dominated by a few giant insurance companies. And um, I don't think very many people are really happy with, you know, the prices they have to pay and the premiums and, you know, and, and the, the quality of care, uh, the system is very fragmented and complicated and very few people can understand it. And, you know, there's fine print and loopholes and, you know, of insurance policies and cost shifting and all of these kinds of things. And, and I know that we practitioners are, are very frustrated um, with, uh, you know, with, with how we, with managed care and, um, you know, and the wedge uh, created by insurance companies between the patient practitioner relationship. So we're trying to reconstitute that and um, in a way we're trying to have this cooperative be a uh, sort of a single payer model which you know which is one payer and one pool and sort of an everybody in nobody out approach if you will um, and um, so we're trying to do this without insurance companies okay that's that's step number one is to Let's see if we can kick out the insurance company and be our own self-funded pools, self-insured, whatever you want to call it, and then directly contract with clinics, hospitals, pharmacies, what have you. Um, and we're, you know, we're really trying to do this through as much um, in-house internal development as we can. So. Um, if we're not relying on insurance companies, there's a lot of work that we got we have to do ourselves, and it requires a lot of um, you know information technology, um, setting up a provider network, um, setting up you know a whole office management information system, and I'm really glad that we have people here, um, database management, um, things that that I have no idea how how they operate, but. Um, I think everybody, you know, understands that we and and you know, I'm, I'm as I say this, I'm, I'm seeing different people here who, who really have skills in these different areas. Um, Rakesh in database management, um, Steve in office management information systems. You know, these different areas of information technology. Bradley in um, web design. Affordable Care Act, literally to, to organize a, a cooperative health insurance pool, and. The $1.5 billion remaining in the fund to fund co-ops in all the 50 states um, was completely defunded, if you will, um, probably by the insurance companies themselves, um, which is a little disappointing, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it, it kind of does say that, uh, you know, that just, just the the fledgling startup that we're that we're doing already is 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 kind of threatening to the insurance companies. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have worked so hard to lobby to get all the damn money, you know, defunded. So, in a way, it's uh, it, it's interesting how, how that happens. But uh, um, I'm not I'm I'm actually still very um, inspired by but what, what what we can do and there are other sources so of funding that is so. Um, so under number two here um, is basically saying that we have to sort of step back a little bit, do a little bit more strategizing on um, how to proceed from here. We were hoping to be the the uh, you know the cooperative in the midst of 
these huge insurance companies, you know, to, to try to level the playing field. Um, because these, this funding is no longer there, um, and there's a very narrow timeline, um, you know, we're not going to be operational by January 1st, 2014. So, you know, we're looking at a longer timeline for that, but, um, but still, um, you know, something like, like forming a cooperative, I think, um, it's just something that to me seems much more feasible and concrete and, and you know, sort of sensible uh, and something that, uh, you know, that we can do um, if, if we all put our minds to it and just keep working towards that. Okay. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I understand about the funding problem and all those things. Uh, but somehow I believe that if an idea is really good, then there has to be a way to make it a reality. And in order for us to make this a reality, we obviously need to identify people who will join us, correct? So I think there has to be some kind of a campaign or we have to start identifying the segments that we can go after or at least who are willing to make some kind of an informal commitment. And if somehow we can ramp up and project, let's say, 20,000 or 40,000 people who can join us, then I think self-funding becomes kind of a automatic. I don't think there is then any need for outside funding to come over here because 40,000 people at a rate of $250 per person is about $10 million a month revenue. So, uh, and then you can start putting together how your expenses are going to be, how the money is going to be used and so on and so forth. So I think the thing that we need to probably worry more about than money is who are the people, I mean, can, can this excitement be created among the masses who would be willing to join us as members? I was just listening on the radio by when I was coming in Vermont there is a grassroots movement that is trying to have a uniform, uh, universal health care, like single-payer health care. And the way these people started was exactly the way we are starting. And they seem to have started to get, I mean, I mean, have a more, lot more traction now. More and more people have started to sign up with them. And so, because now they know who these people are. Now they know what they are talking about. So maybe one idea is that we should start, we should go in churches and talk about our idea, or this is what I, our idea is to see if we can get more people join us and say, well, we are willing to come and this is a good idea. Yes, we want to move in this direction. Because almost everybody is frustrated with health insurance companies. We know that. Yeah, just, and that's a really great point. And we have, you know, we have like enrollment projections. Um, we have revenue projections. Um, and we have different scenarios. Like, you know, I, I, I know everybody here understands like, you know, the, when you're doing something like this, you have a best case scenario, you have a worst case scenario, and you have a middle case scenario. And we have several of these scenarios. Um, we, we, we do know the ways that we can fund this, even without the, the federal funds. Um, as a nonprofit cooperative, and we, this really would be a nonprofit cooperative, um, you'd, like the food co-ops, they're actually for-profit cooperatives, so we can't sell stock, you know, the way food co-ops do. Um, but we can, we can issue, and, and this is getting kind of technical, but we can issue tax-exempt bonds, as because that's what nonprofits can do. So it's sort of similar to when you join a food co-op and they say, well, do you want to buy, you know, these shares? And then you know what I mean. That's how. So like Seward Co-op, you know, or the Wedge. They each have about $11 million in, of capital because of saying to the community, um, you, you want to buy these shares, right? Cooperatives that are now starting up in other areas in the country. And that, what are they doing to create? Okay. What are they have 20, 24 have been funded <coughs> okay. um, in, other, in like 24 other states or whatever. None have been funded in Minnesota. Um, and all of the applicants have, as far as I know, I, I, I don't know the answer specifically to that. I, I just don't know what other co-ops are doing, but um, I'm pretty sure that most of them were relying on these federal funds because there was just billions of dollars, you know, available. So, and I'm sure the other, 
we were one of 24 applicants uh, you know, that applied for this latest you know, funding, which was due on New Year's Eve. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah, so I think most of them really rely, were relying on um, federal funding for both <coughs> startup and solvency funds, like reserve fund. So those are the two areas that we would need funding for is startup funds, you know, and reserve funds. Reserve, it's called solvency or reserve funds or whatever you want to call it. Those are the two main areas that we, we would need funds for. Um, Has there been any effort in trying to identify the other co-ops just to contact them, just to get uh, compare notes, that sort of thing? Well, what, what I can do or anybody else could do is there is a national organization called the National Alliance of State Health Cooperatives. And, um, you know, and they have like conference calls every week. Um, and, you know, none of us has really been on these conference calls. So I suppose that would have, you know, maybe we'd have a better idea if we were on those conference calls. So. I, everybody made, I mean, one of the suggestions was maybe we should uh, find out if, the, if somebody has been successful in getting funding. Uh, then we are talking about private funding. Uh, then we are talking about the bank uh, giving a loan. And uh, you clearly mentioned that uh, the bank is going to give you a loan if they know that you are going to be a viable company or you have a good product. And in our case, I think the strength of our product is the number of people who will join us. So I think it always basically boils down to if we suppose have no funding, and but we are willing to put some effort and to go after and start identifying the people that who can join us, then maybe we should try to start focusing on that. See if we can get these groups who can identify, and if our data, we can start building up this database and say, well, we have reached maybe, uh, uh, these are 100,000 people. If we target, uh, we have a success rate of maybe, let's say, 20%, two, two, uh, uh, like 20,000 uh, 20, people are right there. So that will make our, product very viable, and so if we ask the bank like Affinity to go ahead and loan, give us a loan, then we are asking them to give us a loan against a very good product. Here are 20,000 people who are going to join us, so we will have the money to pay for to meet our bills and so on and so forth. It, their risk is minimized, so they will be able to go and give us. As far as the business plan is concerned, uh, those who are interested, Joe has worked very hard and the business plan looks pretty strong. I mean, it, it has everything that needs a co-op to be successful is already well defined in the business plan. So I think uh, it really is coming down to if we have no money, that's okay. We have the heart, we have the courage, we, let's go and start identifying the people who are going to be benefited from this. And if somehow we can, they can get a even informal commitment, like say yes, if you are functional, I want to join you, then we, we will become a missionary. Can we ask that question to our friend Infinity Plus? Can we use informal commitment as collateral for a bank loan? Like a free application yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. What do you mean by that? A free application. Oh, free application. Yeah, a non-binding application, you know, something like that. Right. Yeah, um, well, you know, it would be great if Jed were here tonight. He just couldn't make it tonight. He was at the last one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, and this is why we need, uh, you know, we just need, uh, you know, people who can really focus on this and who can even, you know, who can meet with Jed. Um, you know, I can do that to some extent for sure. Um, and we can, you know, we can think about, you know, there's, what other, you know, credit unions are there? Proper credit unions, there's like, what, Spire, there's Wings, there, there's a bunch of them. You responded by saying it was, um Lots of the funding we get through premium, and then you mentioned the million and a half coming in January 1st, 2014. And I was thinking about the, the types of people that are coming in, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just questioning, I'm, I just don't know the answers, but I mean, we have to get a variety of, of uh, different premium people. We can't mm -hmm. just get uninsured, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 20,000, I think, or 40,000? 20,000. 20,000. We can't have 20,000 uninsured people. They 
can't pay the premium. <laughs> yeah. 